Uh, okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here, and I'm going to be going over the big 14-game main slate we have here on uh, Friday, September 1. We have made it to September baseball. Um, so, a couple quick housekeeping notes, um, as they pertain to baseball at least. Uh, rosters expanded today from 26 on the active to 28. So, what that means, uh, we are likely to see a bunch of names um, that you've probably never heard of. Um, they get called up and, you know, with two extra spots here, some of them are pitchers naturally, of course, for uh, just whoever needs whatever, but a lot of position players, okay? A lot of guys that, um, you know, they're not worried, the organizations at least, about their service time or anything like that. Um, you know, September call-ups really serve – the organizations pretty well in that respect so they can give some guys a look give some guys some run um you know plenty of plenty of guys in the in the past have come up in september right and they give them a little bit of a look here at the big league level um and then you know going into the following season the next spring right that's when they they really get their shot at spring training so uh Here's where it begins, however. It's not actually at spring training. It's in September. So um, this is what we're looking for. So keep an eye out for a lot of these guys. There's going to be value, okay, from a ton of different teams here. Uh, certainly everybody that's out of it, you're, they're just going to give their young kids a, a run here. And they're all going to be cheap uh, for the most part. Um, we'll get to, you know, a pretty obvious spot for the Yankees coming up, for example. Um, you know, we'll talk about that when we get there. So keep an eye out for all of these guys. It's a huge slate. There's naturally a lot of value all the time, but you're going to have to get different tonight because we've got probably, I mean, right there with the first game of the, um, Atlanta, Colorado series, probably, I mean, certainly a top two spot of the entire season. Um, I think back to the early spring when we had a lot of St. Louis at Colorado as well. Similar spot here with Toronto getting Chris Flexen. Um, they are far and away the, the top stack of the day. Um, but it's 14-game slate, and if you want to play as much Toronto as possible, you are going to have to get different, so keep an eye out for all of these very cheap um, young prospects, right, that... It, it, are super unlikely to get any ownership because nobody's ever heard of them. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, we do have projections and ownership loaded as always. Brief slate overview. Got some expensive arms, but it's going to be hard to get to them, right? Um, similar type of constructions to you know, several days ago, maybe on that first Atlanta slate, right? Where a bunch of guys were seeing heavy ownership up at the top, like Blake Snell and... Um, you know, Kevin Gosman, things like that. I believe they were on the same slate. Similar dynamic here with Max Scherzer getting Minnesota tonight. The matchup is not the question um, or anything like that. It's it's constructions, right? And you this is a 14-game slate, and you almost always want to default to trying to seek value elsewhere on the mound and get it in the batter's box just because um, it's that much more likely on a very – large slate like this that hitters are going to be winning uh, tournaments for you and not pitchers right so um we might be able to come off some of these expensive guys up here and get to some value in the mid-range perhaps not so much in the in the lower range on the pricing spectrum on dk at least uh, but that's kind of a brief slate overview and generally how i, I try to approach very large slates um you know i hate you assume a lot of risk with a guy like Tyler Glasnow, who we will get into here in our first game, that has a um, uh, second game, actually, that has a 14% barrel rate. So uh, let's just get started. Miami and Washington, we'll start there instead. Uh, Yuri Perez on the mound, 8,800. It's a price tag for me that's going to um, you know keep me off of really everything. I'm just going to X Yuri tonight. Uh, I don't like this matchup. Um, at this price tag, of course, against Washington, um, against right-handers this year, still just the 19% K rate. A lot of teams should be able to make a lot of contact tonight, um, not just because they're high-contact teams themselves, but they got high-contact arms um, on the other side. So 
Not necessarily that Yuri Perez is a high contact arm, but this is a bad contact matchup, right? He has a swing and miss. That's not a worry. Uh, but the fastball is, right? You got a really bad fastball here. He has velo. We're not concerned about that necessarily either. Good secondaries, slider curveball change. It's strike one where he has a little bit of control problems, right? Not necessarily strikes two and three, of course. But what that does obviously is elevates pitch count and he's still a very young arm very high upside young arm for the marlins down here so what they do is they deliberately limit his innings right we've only got 75 on him this season they cap him they just yank him after four four and two thirds pretty much every outing um completely irrespective of the pitch count right and we see that reflected here in a full uh 15 starts for him, just 81 pitches per. He doesn't go deep enough into games, and you need more than that at 8,800 on a full 14-game slate. So I'm Xing this. Um, I don't like the matchup. I love the plate discipline and the strike one stuff, and, uh, you know, that's that's a little bit of a work in progress, of course. The strikeout stuff, I mean to say, is definitely a concern. It's the fastball that he really has to start to dial in. He needs to figure out control here going into next season. Drop this barrel rate down, right? Spot the fastball, work off of this a little bit more, allow him to work to the secondaries, and we'll be paying, you know, north of 10000 for Yuri Perez next season if he can figure that out. Uh, but in the meantime, he hasn't done that just yet, and uh, the slate and the matchup here are too large for me to get excited about Yuri. So I'm going to leave him off. Um, Jake Irvin, I'm probably going to do the same thing. Now, at 6,100, he can be in play sometimes because he's so good against the right side of the plate. Uh, 230 batting average, sub-290 Woba, really good number there, and a 110 ISO, just about. Really good number there. 21.5% strikeout rate to the right-handers. Doesn't do some ground balls. Buck 20 ground ball to fly ball here with just 31% hard contact. That's serviceable considering he pitches to 84% contact in aggregate. Um the issue with Jake Irvin is always just upside, and it's mostly to left-handers, right? The, the splits are pretty drastic. 280 average nearly with his 375 Woba nearly, and a 230 ISO. So that's a problem. Strikeout rate drops off about five ticks. Walk rate increases. Fly balls uh, at an 090. Ground ball to fly ball lean and 41% hard contact here. So the split is pretty pronounced, and we need to be careful with that. That's where the barrels come in at a full 10%. He does have some walk concern it's not like nine percent is egregious but it is certainly notable some strike one problems as well uh so at 6100 there's other guys in this range i think you'd probably rather pivot it to than going after the marlins here tonight it's still a pretty respectable offense against right-handed pitching 89 wrc plus they leave it on the table a little bit there but they don't strike out a lot they're pretty sticky and of course they've got uh a, an absolute pest and a damn good hitter up at the top of the lineup from the left side of the plate in Luis rise you could consider playing him tonight as he hits a lot of ground balls. There's no power from him, right? He's 4,800, so that's not good. Um, but the ground ball to fly ball ratio here and the hard contact suggests quite a bit of upside for him. Uh, not necessarily over the wall upside, but this is in Washington, and he's out of Miami. So there's, um, you know, he could still go three for five with two doubles, three runs scored or something tonight. Uh, that's very well within range and perfectly respectable at 4,800. Georgie Soler dealing with the hip issue. Uh, I don't generally want to play right-handers against him, uh, Jake Irvin, that is. Uh, but Georgie Soler, if I'm stacking Miami, I'm certainly not leaving him off. 5,300, I don't really like playing him against right-handers. Um, so it's not the best and not my favorite, certainly. I would much rather just get to left-handers. And he has been dealing with a little bit of the hip issue. He's been scratched twice in the last three days, I believe. So keep an eye out for that. But he's very much in play in Miami constructions if you get there. Josh Bell, 3,700. Not my favorite sole first base play today. Uh, but playable in stacks for sure. Jazz Chisholm, one of my favorite outfielders, definitely. I really like this spot for him. He's fantastic against most right-handers in baseball. And his price hasn't moved. Uh, I really do like this for sure. So you can find a Miami stack with the top four. I'm probably staying off of Jake Berger, Berger and Brian De La Cruz, but Jesus Sanchez or Joey Wendell from a contact perspective and a price perspective at 28 and 2300 respectively down at the bottom of the lineup are fine stack fillers for you if you choose to get there. Don't think that's bad. 6,100 for Jake Irvin can be in play sometimes. If Georgie Soler is out of the lineup, um, you know, you'll have to do or take an eye keep an eye out rather for what the Marlins do easy for me to spit out um 
and see how they construct their list. It could put Jake Irvin a little bit more in play. Certainly has a more upside than 2% ownership here. Um, but does he have 25 and 30 point upside? Uh, it's pretty rare, I think, that he he cracks to those numbers. So um, I'm going to leave him off as well. I do like Miami here a little bit. Uh, no Washington for me going against, going after Yuri. Uh, I do respect him. Does give up some barrels, but uh, left-handers, it'd be like Cabert Ruiz, but I don't really want to pay 4000 for a catcher in a 14-game slate um, as a one-off necessarily. He's okay because he doesn't strike out. C.J. Abrams still has good numbers against righties, but um, you know this is a difficult matchup. Yuri Perez, I still respect the talent here. And uh, I'm probably just going to stay off of pitching and most of offense in this game outside of those Marlins stacks. Okay, let's move on. Tampa and Cleveland. Here's Tyler Glass now and that 14% barrel rate I mentioned. Um, now, that's going to keep me off. He's got problems here, man. Like, there's way too much hard contact. I don't care about the ground balls. Uh, it, against the left-handers, I'm really excited about that. I can stomach a lot of hard contact against the opposite side of the platoon, um, when you induce this many ground balls. But he still gives up power and doesn't induce any soft contact, right? So it's a lot of really, really loud and barrel contact here for Tyler Glass. Now, 11-2, um, we also sometimes have some depth concerns with him. This season, he's now that he's uh, you know getting more starts and more innings under his belt, um, he's actually gone far deeper than he has you know in his career on average. But still... 90 pitches per start is leaving it a little bit on the table for us at 11,200. This is also a horrible strikeout matchup, right? Cleveland's still very sticky uh, and incredibly difficult to get through. 19% aggregate K rate for them, creating at a 96 WRC plus hit for some average, right? 256 here. Uh, it's just no power, no hard contact, and some ground balls. So that's what's obviously going to keep Glasnow in play, right? He obviously has 33% strikeouts in the tank form. Um, that's not really a problem. I don't want any right-handers against him whatsoever, despite more fly balls and just as much hard contact here at 42%. Um, he just doesn't give up a lot of power there because a lot of stuff is still on the ground, and he's got a 30% strikeout rate. So it's lefties, good thing for Cleveland. They're going to platoon a little bit, right? Stephen Kwan, Josie Ramirez, Cole Calhoun, Andres Jimenez, Will Brennan, Bo Naylor, right? All from the left side. I, that doesn't mean I want to go after go after Tyler Glass now and go out of my way to play some Cleveland here against him. Where they're well-priced, sure, but not Cole Calhoun on a 14-game slate at 3,400 against Glass now. It's not happening. Uh, Stephen Kwan, 3,500. That's a fine contact piece if you get there because he's leading off. And Josie Ramirez, you can always play against everybody. Um, but I'm not going out of my way to play Cleveland here because I hate playing Cleveland. But I am going to stay off of Tyler Glass now. I came in well under this in my first build this morning. And I might end up just Xing him because I hate this price tag and I hate it with the barrel rate and I hate the, the strikeout matchup. So um, now that makes him a good tournament play. But even at 10% field ownership here like this is just a total non-starter for me in this spot so i'm gonna stay off of it um sometimes that'll burn me but i think he's just way too expensive in this particular matchup cal quantro we're gonna get him back tonight he's been dealing with a shoulder injury really all season he's dealt with it twice i believe um so that's a concern from an injury standpoint we're not trying to project injuries or anything he's 5300 and that has to put him in play, but he pitches to 84% contact, and this is still Tampa, right? 120 WRC plus against righties this season, 4,000 PAs now, 23% K rate. Sure, they're attackable there, but Cal Quantrill has a 12% strikeout rate this season alone. He doesn't throw it past anybody. He is a finesse pitcher, right? Has six pitches, but none of them really any good. Break even two seamer, and that's the only value he's getting out of the arsenal. So, uh, there's very little chase, very few swinging strikes, very few called strikes, just a 21% CSW here. That's uh, pretty dreadful. Um, so I think you can very much consider Tampa because there's going to be so much contact at 84% raw for Cal Quantrill. Um, now, 5,300 does put him in play. Wouldn't be surprised if he pops for about 16 points or something and survives five innings or whatever. But that's pretty much his ceiling, and I think you're going to need quite a bit more than that this evening. Uh, on a full 14-game slate. So I'm going to leave him off as well. No pitching in this game for me. That doesn't mean I really want to, of course, go after Glass now or stack Tampa necessarily. I still kind of respect Cal Quantrill to suppress sometimes, right? Against righties in particular, still pretty good from a power suppression perspective. Uh, does give a batting average, of course, to everybody. So that's why you can really stack Tampa. 
Um, I want some fly ballers, certainly, from both sides of the plate. And from the left side, that's where I really try to focus. That's Brandon Lau. He's a decent $4,700 second base play today. Uh, Josh Lowe is fine at 4000 I like that price tag for him. Luke Rayleigh, fly ball hitter, 39 probably not, as he has been struggling recently, and they've shoved him down to the bottom of the lineup. So we'll have to keep an eye out. They brought back up uh, Vidal Brujan. Um, he'll be in the infield likely with uh, Wander Franco still on the restricted list. So... Um, lefties mostly, but you can certainly get to Isak. He's got really good numbers against right-handers. That's fine. Um, and a fine sort of cheap shortstop play in the middle of the lineup here, Oslevis Pasabe, uh, that is also respectable. You can certainly play Yandi, who doesn't strike out, but he's expensive. And at first base, 5,600, that's tough. And Randy is always in play, of course. So you can find Tampa stacks. They're not my favorite necessarily, of course. And down the board a little bit. Uh, but very much uh, achievable, right, to get there with some Tampa stacks against Qual Cal Quantrill. The contact rate is just too high. Okay, let's move on to Seattle and the Mets. Um, interesting pitching matchup here, right? Logan Gilbert, could I Sanga, 93 for Gilbert. Uh, I did get some here. I, I think this is okay. I'm not super thrilled about the price tag or the matchup necessarily. So I'll likely come in um, under, but... It did, like, getting some exposure here to Logan Gilbert, I think, is pretty warranted. Overall, plate discipline's pretty damn good, right? 27% CSW. Need a little m bit more in the call strike category out of him. But walk rate's impeccable. Sub 5%. Strike 1 is excellent. Chase is great at north of 32%. No problems there. Uh, strand rate, perhaps a little bit low. Mid-3 ZRA with expected right there in the same range. Everything is great for Logan Gilbert. Still a pretty young arm here. Good distribution in the four-pitch mix. Uh, needs a little bit more value out of the fastball and the off-speed pitch, um, but that will come with time because he still has good velocity, 96+. plus. Uh, everything's great. I have no problems playing Logan Gilbert. I, I always like playing Logan Gilbert. Um, from a contact and batter ball perspective, we want to get to him mostly with left-handers from a fly ball and, uh, point of view. 080 ground ball to fly ball there with a 34% hard contact, slightly elevated line drive rate. So that's how he, you can attack with him. But you got to be careful. It's got to be with lower strikeout guys because he does still have the 26% strikeouts to the lefties in the tank. From the right-handers, you don't really want to deal with this necessarily, certainly from a batting average perspective. Um, hey, perhaps running a little bit hot. You know, this season, about you know, a point, point and a half or so. Same thing in the WOBA. And in the ISO, you know, roughly in the same range. So everything here with Gilbert, uh, the numbers are suggesting he should be mostly exactly where he is. And um, that's why I have no real problems going against, or going after, rather, a pretty attackable offense in the Mets here with decent right-handers. 103 WRC plus for them. It's just that they're a little bit sticky. Not hitting for a lot of batting average themselves. Sub 240 over here. 170 ISO, a little bit of sneaky pop there, but overall pretty unimpressive. Um, slightly above average in terms of just pure run creation. But this is a below average matchup because Logan Gilbert is an above average arm, right? So uh, no problems really with any exposures to Logan Gilbert. It's a construction thing, and a lot, you've really got a lot of options on the mound today. Um so that's what's going to keep the ownership for me down quite a bit. But because uh, there's several guys I want to play, they're a little bit cheaper. Um, but I've got no problems landing on some of this at pretty low ownership. It's going to make you contrarian just kind of by default here. And you're going to need that in a lot of your Toronto teams tonight. So uh, no problem getting to Gilbert if I want to go after him. Well, I really don't. It would probably be uh, with a left-hander that has a neutral ground ball to fly, but maybe a Dandy Vogelbach. He's a cheap 2,800 here. Uh, I think that's maybe okay. Brandon Nimmo's fine at 4,400. Frankie Lindor back under 5,000 at 49. Okay as well. And you can always play PD from the right side at 5,000. But uh, like I said, this is at City Field, only 70, 75 degrees there. Much better hitting environments that we can go after tonight than uh, targeting a, a really high upside, really good arm in Logan Gilbert. Could I Sanga going for the Mets? I mean, the price tag's still too high for me, man. Um, now, I did get some, of course, eh, but it's it's still not approaching where the field is. Um, I came in at 
you know, about half of this today in my first build. Um, it's not that it, the matchup is bad or anything, right? Seattle against right-handers, at least over the last month, they've actually been fantastic. They're 19 games over 500 now, which is kind of shocking, leading this division over here. Also pretty shocking because for the first, what, five months of the season, um, they were absolutely horrible. Stone break even in every single metric. It's just that they've been creating. They've had a lot of really good matchups recently. And they've capitalized on those, so good on them. But they still strike out. 26% clip here still don't hit for north of a 240 batting average, similar to the Mets, right? 180 ISO, they hit for more power. That's mostly because J.P. Crawford, uh, Cal Raleigh, Tay Oscar have really started to figure it out. Um, when I said J.P. Crawford, I meant Julio Rodriguez. Um, but even J.P. Crawford's been a little bit better at the power department recently also. Gino has been a little bit better, too. Wasn't nearly or hasn't been nearly as bad as he was early, early in the season. Same thing with Ty France. Josh Rojas was a nice second base pickup for them. Um, and he's been productive down at the bottom of the lineup, as has um, you know, a guy like uh, Josie Caballero in the middle infield, for example. So they've been far more respectable recently, but they're still very attackable with high strikeout arms like Kodai Senga. He still has that. That's never been the problem with him, of course. It's the strike one. It's the walk rate. Um, chase, if the, it, you know, if the secondaries were so good for Kodai Senga, where's the chase? It's only a 28.5% here. Now, the, the CSW is pushing 29%. That's fine, but it's still a price tag and a very susceptible walk rate. The Mariners over here, they're getting a little bit more patient, 9%. That's not a small number for an aggregate team walk rate. So overall, uh, I'm probably just going to come in under again. Not sure if I'll X him. I, I may just because there's other guys I'd like to get more exposure to, notably like a Logan Gilbert, 300 cheaper. I'd rather just play him, I think. Uh, but there's far higher strikeout upside, undoubtedly, for Kadai Senga. So I've got no problem playing him. If you land on a bunch of teams here, I'm just going to come in under this uh, because I hate this walk rate. Uh, we'll, we'll get into it a little bit more with another guy who I'm probably going to be forced to play tonight. Um, and I'll rant about my walk rate concerns there but for Senga I've got no problem with a pure strikeout upside he's going deeper into games he is toning down the walks but it's still two and three every single outing and that's enough to be uh, pretty worrisome when you can't go more than six innings at nearly 10,000 so that's how I'm going to approach this I don't really want to target Kodai Senga over here uh, you can always take some stacks against him uh, with low strikeout hitters uh, because of this walk rate but um He's highly variant, and I think this is a pretty poor matchup offensively f for both teams here. So uh, mostly pitching here, but kind of a write-off for the most part for me. Let's move on to Minnesota and Texas. Joe Ryan, 8,600. All right. Uh, th this is a re really nice price tag for Joe Ryan. Okay, This is a seasonal price low. Um, he hasn't been this cheap since literally the first outing of the season back in April. Uh, this is a bad matchup, undoubtedly. Um, we don't want to go after Texas. It's the second time in as many starts that he is seeing Texas. Same thing with Scherzer on the other side. We had this exact matchup not five days ago. So that's a problem, right? Uh, we have to side with the offense, and certainly one of the best offenses in baseball when we get this kind of uh, setup here, if you will. 113 WRC plus 37% hard contact for the Rangers, 20 sub 23%. Strikeout rate, neutral ground ball to fly ball. The guys that you're scared of at the top of the lineup, really damn good hitters, and they all lift the baseball outside of Nate Low. Um, problems. That, that's a problem for Joe Ryan. However, 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 if you look back to his previous start against Texas, he survived. And why does he survive? Well, he's a heavy fly ball pitcher. And as I just mentioned, the guys at the top of the lineup, Marcus Semyon, Corey Seager, Addy Garcia, Mitch Garver, you know, three of those guys right-handed, and all three of those guys are fly ball hitters. And that is a fine suppression spot for Joe Ryan. Still has a lot of strikeout stuff. Mitch Garver and Addy Garcia get a strikeout a lot, north of 25% for both of them. Marcus Semien, not so much, but he still does hit a lot of fly balls. Um, so this is a problem for Texas when you just, like, instantly click them in against uh, Joe Ryan. Um heavy fly ball pitcher that gives up 38% hard contact. We've got to go a little bit deeper than that with Joe. He has 34% Ks in the tank against the right-handers, despite the 38% hard, 050 ground ball to fly ball, and a 256 ISO allowed to the righties. That's how he's attackable, definitely. Um, but we got to be a little careful here because the two guys that are 
uh, that have the highest fly ball rates and highest upside against right-handed pitching um, are Addy Garcia and Mitch Garver, right? And they strike out a lot. So that's a problem. Um, and Marcus Simeon, 6000 Do we really want to go out of our way to be targeting Joe Ryan with a $6,000 second baseman? On a 14-game slate? Eh, probably not, right? So not my favorite price adjusted here. I'm always terrified of Corey Seager, no matter, you know, righty, lefty, doesn't matter. Um, and this is actually a pretty damn good bat of ball spot for him, despite the fact that Joe doesn't give up a lot of production to lefties. 211 batting average, 272 Woba, 130 ISO, with 24% K rate. Elite numbers there, 19% soft, 27% hard contact to the left side. It's the right-handers you want, so if you want to go after him, um, sure, play Mitch Garver. That's it's okay. He's still a a fine batted ball profile matchup here. He's got about an 080, 090 ground ball to fly ball uh, against righties. Even though he is a you know fly ball lean, um, it does still match up okay for him. 3900, not my favorite because he's going to strike out a lot still. So uh, if you do want to get to a couple of righties, it's kind of as Zeke Duran, Leody Tavares down at the bottom of the lineup who match up the best batted ball wise. Um, I don't really want to be playing Zeke Duran in this matchup. He'll strike out two at, at 3,800 down in the eight hole third base, you know. So it's, it's not excellent, and that's why I think Joe Ryan could survive at 8,600 once again. He's 1,000 cheaper than he was in his previous outing not five days ago against in this exact same matchup, right? So, uh, And he survived just fine. So I have no problems landing on a little bit of Joe Ryan here. I love Joe Ryan. I love this split change. This, this slider sweeper shenanigans that he's dealing with here like he's got to get this figured out um because historically he's been a he's had problems with left-handers so when the value on this split change uh sort of neutralizes and the league gets a, a quite a bit better book on him going into next year the numbers could very well skyrocket in terms of production allowed to the lefties and if he doesn't figure out the slider then he's going to be attackable with both sides again with the heavy fly ball lean so um that time is not now necessarily. I do like Nate Lowe from the left side up at the top, but he's 4,600. I'm not super thrilled about that because he's not all that high an upside bat himself, but he's a good hitter, good contact hitter. Um, and at first base, not my favorite necessarily, but you like you could find something here for Texas, but I'd probably prefer to just side with Joe Ryan. I did get a little bit north of the field here in my first run this morning so uh, for a little bit of context. Uh, I think he's in play, even though I hate, hate, hate going after Texas. Scherzer on the other side, I'm going to approach him the exact same way that I'm approaching Kevin Gosman. However, with quite a bit more trepidation because this is the twins he gets on the other side. Um, 25% K rate. The ownership's tanking, actually, in the first several runs. It went north of 30. Now it's uh, at about 25%. It's starting to, to drop off pretty precipitously here. In the uh, several hours leading up to lock, 11,000, though, it's the price tag, man. It's not the matchup. It's not the plate discipline or anything like that. This is the Max Scherzer that we uh, that we know, right? Um, still giving up power, 200 ISO to righties, 163 ISO to lefties, 170X ISO. He's still running, uh, you know, about a tick hot, uh, excuse me, a, t a tick cold, right? The, the ISO numbers are a little higher than the X ISO. Um, we could even see a little bit more power regression to the to the upside, at least for him, um, you know, coming soon as he gets more and more innings, healthy innings under his belt. He's still elite in the batting average category, still elite in the Woba category, no problems here. It's just that he's always had a homer problem, right? He's a fly ball pitcher that gives up a little bit of pop in the air. Um, that's how you can go after him. However, there's so many strikeouts here, and the Twins are going to platoon pretty heavily with fly-balling left-handers for the most part, like a Matt Walner and a Max Kepler. Joey Gallo, of course. Um, Eddie Julian's actually a pretty damn good batted ball profile matchup here against Scherzer. He had so many ground balls that this fly ball lean for Scherzer and, and hard contact lean actually match up pretty well with Eddie. So he's still a, a great $3,500 um, second base filler because he leads off, but he will strike out a lot uh, in this particular matchup. So not my favorite playing the Twins, which is why Scherzer is seeing so much ownership here, but not my favorite playing him. Wouldn't be surprised if he pops for 25, but you probably, you, you, given the rest of the slate and so many other cheaper pitchers that at their price tags have more relative upside, you probably need 30 or 35 out of Scherzer tonight um, with pretty 
high regularity. And, you know, now we're starting to get kind of carried away. It's 11,000, and that prevents you from getting to a lot of stuff that you want to get to in a batter's box. So that's what's going to keep my ownership down. And I came in way, way under to this. There's just no chance I, I get this much. Uh, let's see, looking on the other side here, I got, you know, south of 10%, you know, so, um, it's a construction thing, it's not a matchup or a plate discipline or, or fundamentals thing, uh, really at all, it's just a construction, so, um, I don't really want to play any of the Twins outside of Eddie, uh, even, uh, you know, like Max Kepler, who I, I like from a, a lower strikeout standpoint, not my favorite here, so, uh, I don't want to deal with any of the Twins, which, makes me very nervous about coming under the field on Scherzer, but um, I'm not all that worried because he's 11,000. Okay, let's move on to the Yankees in Houston. Um, Carlos Rodon, you know, I love this price tag. I hate this matchup, so it's not happening. 6,700 is great, but uh, we're not we're not doing this with a left-hander against Houston uh, now that everybody's healthy. 18% strikeout rate, 280 batting average, 198 aggregate ISO, and a 126 WRC+. Plus. There's just zero chance I play Carlos Rodon right now. Um, I'm still in wait-and-see mode with him. We're kind of seeing the same sort of nonsense that we saw with Verlander on the other side of the game. And with Scherzer, for example, in the earlier part of the season where they were hurt and they just aren't totally warmed up yet. You know, these guys need to get into a rhythm, and this is not the uh, matchup that we want to be, you know, taking shots on a high upside arm that has historically great numbers against both sides of the plate. Could, at this price tag, perform pretty well for you. But I'm not doing this on a 14-game slate. He's a total X for me. And that means the Astros just have to be in play because their numbers are great. His numbers, Rodone's, are pretty poor against right-handers so far in the 130 hitters that he's seen. 243 batting average, not the worst. 345 Woba, not the worst, but elevated for sure. Mo they're partially due to a 10.5% uh, walk right there, but a 218 ISO, that's a problem. 19% strikeout rate, that's a problem. 065 ground ball to fly ball. He's always been a fly ball pitcher, but he's now giving up 43 44% aggregate hard contact. Uh, to both sides. So this is a total no, absolute non-starter, 12% uh, walk rate in aggregate in eight starts here. Uh, yeah, this is a big issue. He's got to get this figured out. So we're not doing this uh, against Houston. And Josie Altuve, batted ball-wise, matches up pretty well as a ground ball hitter. 6,200, however, I hate the price tag. Probably rather play him than Semyon. Um, you know, but it's it's pretty close between the two because they're both stupid expensive. Alex Bregman, I don't really want here tonight. He's a fly ball hitter. And against lefties, his numbers are, well, they're not nearly as good against uh, as they are against right-handers. Um, Kyle Tucker, as a matter of fact, has better numbers against left-handers than Jordan Alvarez does this season. Um, Josie Abreu really jumped off the page at me, as a matter of fact. They might move him back up to the five hole. He's been far, far better recently, given how atrocious he was earlier in the season. 3,000 at first base. Sole first base is not uh, really all that attractive, of course, but 3,000 really kind of is, and this is a damn good matchup for him. Um, he'll still lift it a little bit, but he's roughly a neutral ground ball to fly ball against lefty. He's always been a very, very equitable hitter against left-handers, and when he is right, as he has been over the last month or two, um, you know, 3,000, it, it, it's straight up underpriced for him. So uh, it did kind of jump off the page at me. Chaz at 48, not so much. Um, he'll strike out still. But the numbers, really, against both righties and lefties are, are great this season. Yiner Diaz, we want him more against the right side so far this year. His splits will uh, normalize a little bit, but um, not my favorite first and catcher piece. He did get first base eligibility, however. Um, so you can play you know, both Abreu and Yiner Diaz if you choose to do that with like a short Jose Altuve. Maybe even throw in a Kyle Tucker if you'd like to do that. Martin Maldonado has got actually incredible numbers against left-handers this year from a power perspective, and he's actually hitting for a little bit of batting average. So behind the plate at 2,300, I don't think this is the worst punt in the world. And I think that's probably the first time in about five years that I've said that for Martin Maldonado. I do remember a couple of seasons ago, I did play him once when he was with the Angels, um, and he hit a bomb in that game, and I haven't played him since. So um, maybe tonight he will get there for us against Carlos Rodon. Who knows? But at 2,300, I think, think that is fine. Same with thing with Jeremy Pena. I don't want to play him down in the 8-hole at 4,100, but he has fine numbers against left-handers this season. So... You could find a Houston stack. They're expensive, and you're going to have to play the guys down at the bottom of the lineup, but they're very contrarian, as they are always, at these price tags, and this is a fine spot to get some of them. 
getting after a little bit of Carlos Rodon. Justin Verlander, 9,800 on the mound for him. I want to play some here, uh, but it's a price tag that I'm a little concerned with, right? I did get roughly the field here, or two same exposures as the field, I should say. Um, I do like the matchup because the Yankees are terrible. However, uh, I did allude to a very high upside hit tool prospect that they are bringing up for September here, Jason Dominguez. He is a stone minimum $2,000 outfielder. He is a switch hitter, and this kid uh, is going to be one of the best hitters in baseball, um, You know, assuming he can stay healthy and et cetera, et cetera, uh, when he finally gets run. And this will be his major league debut. He's been a very high upside prospect for the Yankees for a, a really long time. Um, and they're finally bringing him up and making it happen. So baseball world should be pretty excited to finally get to see him at this level. This is a tough matchup, of course, against Verlander. But strikeout stuff for Verlander is quite depressed. All right, so at this price tag and this strikeout stuff with a, a couple more lefties that they're going to be able to throw into the lineup here, I'm a little bit concerned Um about pure upside. I think a couple of these guys are going to be able to get to him. I'm always terrified of Judge, of course, not necessarily of Stanton. Um, DJ's been far, far better recently, making a lot more contact now that he's a little bit healthier and getting more regular ABs up at the top of the lineup. Um, and Jason Dominguez is going to give them a lefty presence in the middle. So we'll have to see what they want to do, how they want to structure the lineup. But I think Dominguez is, is certainly my favorite play from the Yankees if I'm getting to a lot of Verlander and you know 15 20 percent or whatever is kind of a lot I'm still worried about the strike one with him and the pure upside strikeout rate at 9800 so that's what would take me off and of course the construction at this particular price tag uh but I've got no problems otherwise with the matchup you know this, despite my adoration for Dominguez um and his upside in the future like, this is still his debut, this is still Justin Verlander, and he can still win this matchup. Let's not get it confused. So, fly balls and, uh, you know, some hard contact a little bit to the righties are how we kind of want to uh, attack Justin Verlander, but the numbers aren't all that attackable for the most part, you know. So, still a sub-150 ISO this season, um, and a 235 batting average allowed to the righties. So, I got no problems playing Verlander, but I do want to take a couple of pieces on the other side, notably... Um, and Aaron Judge and a Jason Dominguez, mostly just one-offs there. So that's how I want to approach this game. Okay, let's move on. Philly and Milwaukee. Uh, Zach Wheeler coming off a really good start against the Cardinals. 10-6, it's construction. I'd rather play him than Freddie Peralta on the other side of the game. We'll get to that in a sec. Um, plate discipline still excellent for Wheeler, right? Not a single issue um, or a single metric that I take issue with, I should say, in the plate discipline. 27% Ks, 5% walk rate's fantastic. I, I absolutely love it. 63% strike one, 33% chase. Let's do it with a 27% CSW. Likes to work cold strikes out of him, and that's a little bit of lacking value in the breaking arsenal still with the break-even slider and a pretty poor value in the curveball. But for the most part, mid-3 ZRA for Wheeler, kind of underperformed to uh, his expectation and really his standards, but, uh, you know, mid three ZRA is not a bad number by any means. Um, 71% strand rate here is still quite low for Zach Wheeler, given how much swing and miss he does have. We do want, if we're going after him, some lefty heavy lineups. That's where he's mostly attackable from a pure contact perspective, gives up more fly balls there, more hard contact, and more power, more batting average as well. So kind of across the board here, but it's not all that attackable no matter how you slice it. And Brewers are really going to have, what, like four or five lefties in here. Um, they did With Rowdy back, it makes them far more uh, serviceable against good right-handed pitching because it doesn't strike out a lot. And he still has some pop from the left side of the plate. So they'll have Yelich, they'll have Santana, Freelich, Rowdy, and probably Bryce Terang. So they can go a little bit lefty-heavy here, which takes me off of Zach Wheeler at this particular price tag a tiny bit. But it's not to say that I'm necessarily super scared of any of these left-handers from the Brewers. Um, Chris Yelich is an okay bat of ball matchup here. I don't really want to go out of my way to be playing him at his normal price tag in this particular matchup. So kind of off of that. Same thing with Freelich. Not a ton of power upside. Fine 4,300 if you get there. Don't want to go out of my way to play Carlos Santana necessarily. do like the 3,600 for him. 
but now you got to choose between him and Rowdy, so that kind of sucks too. Uh, Bryce Terang, um, not necessarily in this matchup. So not super thrilled about playing the Brewers. That's why I do kind of like Zach Wheeler, but I don't like the price tag for him. I did get some, and I came in roughly with the field, and that's mostly how I'm going to uh, come in with a lot of these guys here. Just got to spread it out on the mound and get to as much Toronto as I, I possibly can. Freddie Peralta, though, I don't really understand this high ownership here. 15% similar to Justin Verlander. I'd rather play Verlander, to be quite honest. Um, I think Freddie, I think this price tag is really reflecting his most recent results. Um, you know, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I have problems with the walk rate. And if I'm directly comparing the two, and I kind of am because they're the same price tag, uh, I would much rather play Zach Wheeler with basically identical plate discipline numbers to Freddie, um, but half of the walk rate. So just give me that instead. Now, Freddie does have uh, a few more swing strikes in him, right? A little bit more in the called strike category as well. That's popping the CSW up to 30 from the 27.5 for Wheeler. So, you know, 2.5% is 2.5%. We can't ignore that. But uh, for the most part, everything else is pretty damn similar. Lower barrel rate for Wheeler to the tune of 3%, and that's, you know, absolutely notable. Um, everything else, though, is kind of favoring Wheeler here. From a power perspective, absolutely. 191 ISO allowed to the right-handers for Freddie, despite, you know, an attractive 36% strikeout rate. Fly balls for him. More hard contact, though, in the same side of the platoon for him at 36% compared to Wheeler, who's at just 29%. And he induces more ground balls. So that's why I kind of lean to Zach Wheeler here um, at half of the ownership. But both of these guys, I'll probably just end up Xing Freddie, I would assume, play... Verlander or just pivot it up to Zach Wheeler and get better ownership and uh, get a little bit more contrarian on it. I've got no problem for the most part from a plate discipline perspective playing him uh, in this matchup because the Phillies are still bad, right? Um, but Harper is starting to round into form here a little bit, and he's only striking out against righties at least um, at a 20% clip. You know, Kyle Schwarber's still going to swing and miss a hell of a lot. Trey Turner against righty striking out 25% clip or whatever. Castellanos, not a 5,200. I'm not playing him. Bryson Stott and Alec Bohm, from a contact perspective, they're very sticky, but you're not going out of your way to play them at 46 and 4,500, respectively. You're still not playing JTR at 5,400 in the seven hole. That's not happening, right? And 57 for Schwarber, and even 62 for Harper, 59 for Trey Turner. You're not doing this. So that's why I think Freddie is very much in play, but because you could just take shorts in the Phillies, with a high upside arm. Sure, go ahead. I've got no problems doing that, but construction-wise, uh, there's other arms that I'd just rather pivot it to. So no problems there. I, I certainly don't want to play Philadelphia at those price tags, and I really don't want to play much of the Brewers on the other side because I don't think the matchup's all that good. So uh, kind of a write-off game for me for the most part and under on pitching if I get to really anything. Okay, let's move on to Detroit and the White Sox. Uh, we'll get to Tukey in a second. Um, 9,400 for Eddie Rodriguez. I got no problems here either. Like, there's a, there's other guys in this range, but, I mean, D Eddie is certainly one of them for Detroit here um, at very low ownership. I love this ownership, and Eddie's been fantastic the, really the whole season. Uh, really figured it out, and now that he's healthy, he's thrown a lot of innings, and it, it's really good to see Eddie uh, kind of round back into form because his numbers last year were pretty dreadful. Um 24% aggregate K rate, power and expected power numbers are fantastic in the um, the isolated power metric, right? WOBA versus ex-WOBA, it's all excellent. Same thing with the expected batting average. Hard contact's fantastic. Ground ball to fly ball is fine at uh, neutral. He's a pretty significant um, split here with a, nearly two ground balls per fly ball to the lefties versus 090 to the righties. So if you want to get to him from a contact and fly ball perspective it's with a right hander uh or a um a, a ground balling type of right hander well good news for the white Sox; they do have some of them right well they got quite a few of them tim anderson's good for like two or three of them as a matter of fact he's 3000 so this is a fine batted ball matchup for him he's striking out a little bit um and he's not been good we expect him to bounce pretty hard eventually, but it might not be this season. Luis Roberts, the fly ball hitter, so you not necessarily want to go out of your way to do that, but he's fine. He's still the best pure power and DFS hitter on the team. Uh, Eloy Jimenez still hits for average, 3,600, fine price tag. Yoan Moncada from the right side, fine price tag, 3,300. Same thing with Andrew Vaughn at 31. Trace Thompson, probably not here. He's going to strike out a little bit, uh, but he has plenty of pop against the right side. Um, 
whoever they throw down at the bottom of the lineup, uh, Lennon Sosa, Corey Lee, whatever, probably not going to be getting to them against Eddie here tonight. So I got no problems playing Eddie because the White Sox are still pretty bad. You know, in aggregate here, they are at a 25% K rate against lefties nearly this season, 96 WRC+, plus, but really not a lot of power or hard contact. It's just that they'll hit for some average. They can be a bit sticky. So price tag-wise, a few of these guys are in place. Maybe some short stacks you want to go after, Eddie, but I really don't. I, I love the ownership on him here, and I think this is a, a perfectly respectable uh, pivot off of something like a Logan Gilbert or a play in in that same range. Um now, pivot off of Kodai Senga or even Verlander, a little bit more expensive. I think he's very much playable uh, in this particular matchup. And at super low ownership, he can get you very contrarian teams. Uh, Tuki Toussaint at 6,000. All right. Uh, like, I have to have some 6,000 here, but it's a construction thing. It's not that I want to play Tuki. I, I cannot stand walks. And he has a 17% walk rate. But this price tag here and construction-wise, because I want to play some more expensive pitchers, I don't really want to play anybody cheaper than him, and I want to play a lot of expensive or, or uh, hitters as well. I, I'm not really gonna have a choice, and uh, unfortunately, I'm just gonna like run teams and and hope it, um, it just doesn't bite me in the ass. But I'm gonna have to have more than this. I came in at three x the field on my first build. Uh, I'm gonna massage that a little bit for sure, but I'm gonna have more than the field here. Because from a suppression standpoint, Tukey is still not that bad. Uh, 230 batting average, 236 XBA, right? Two, or 350 X Woba. That's a little elevated, but it's mostly because of the damn walk rate here at 17%. Buck 56 X ISO is pretty damn good. 31.5% strikeout rate against right handers. They'll still have four or five righties in the lineup tonight. They'll probably bring up some lefties, um, you know, for the September call up type of stuff. A kill Badu at the top of the lineup, 3,000. He's a pretty damn good play, but he might walk a little bit here. He'll hit the ball in the air, which is what you want against Tukey from the left side. But he's going to walk a little bit, so maybe not my favorite. I would kind of prefer to get to, from a bad ball perspective, a little bit of Riley Green at 48, but he's 48, so I don't want to do that. 46 under for Kerry Carpenter. I really like that. Um, you know, From a batted ball perspective here, he's a high fly ball hitter. I don't necessarily like the price tag. But this is okay because there's going to be some base runners um, getting on ahead of him. So I'm okay there as well. Same with Zach McKinstry. Good contact piece, second base and shortstop at 4,000, probably in the five hole. Uh, don't want to deal with any of the righties here whatsoever against Tukey. Too many ground balls and a lot of strikeouts here. So I do think that this, because this is Detroit and still these lefties were, are going to strike out a lot. Um, a little bit of upside for him, even though his strikeout stuff in aggregate is only 14% against the left side. I mean, all of their strikeout rates are well north of 25. So there's a little bit of upside here for him. Also, some upside for the lefties from Detroit. So this is a, a play bowl sides type of spot for me here. Um, you can bet your ass that I'm going to have, if I'm going to have a lot of Tukey, I'm going to have Detroit on the other side. There's no chance that I expose myself to this 17% walk rate without coverage on the other side. So um, that's how I want to play it here. I, I'm going to have Tukey. I am not happy about it. And uh, I'm probably going to, you know, let this video go up and then delete it. So there's no record of me ever doing this, but um, 17% walk rate and 51% strike one. is just absolutely egregiously terrible. And, uh, well, I don't need to continue to rant on how frustrating walks are. In any case, uh, offense is uh, findable, uh, so to speak, uh, in this in this game here. My favorite would have to be Detroit because of the very high walk rate and full stacks. Um, and I don't want to go after Eddie. So I like correlated Detroit teams. I think that's viable. Um, one of the few times I'm going to say, yeah, let's go play some Tigers. Uh, on, on full 14-game slates this entire year. But uh, it's absolutely in play here. So um, that's how I want to approach it a little bit. I'll have some Tukey, but I'm really not thrilled about it. Okay, Boston and Kansas City. James Paxton, I want to play a good bit of this. I think he's underpriced. Uh, I think the ownership is probably too low, but it's a really a reflection of how many guys we got to play here today. There's not a lot of offense I've really said that I'm super thrilled about playing. Uh, we'll get to one probably in the next game, I think. Um. 
but it, like I want to play Paxton. You know, he's he's just too cheap here, 7,500, 28% strikeouts, and Royals here from the right side. Uh, Mikel Garcia, Bobby Witt, Salvi Perez, still going to have some righties that, that will whiff. Smod Taylor, even Freddie Fermin, going to whiff a little bit. Um, they're going to platoon very heavily, though, because they brought some younger guys up to just give them some run. Nelson Velasquez has pretty historically good numbers uh, against the left side, and that's how we want to attack Paxton if we do so. 36% hard contact with an 095 ground ball to fly ball lean. Does give up pop to a, the tune of a 200 ISO. So... That's how you can go after him, but I don't really want to do this with the Royals. They're still a pretty poor creation offense against lefties, despite the fact that they've made respectable hard contact all season. 84 WRC plus and his 24% K rate. Sub-250 batting average and a sub-300 Woba with a 143 ISO. Uh, not all that thrilling. So give me Paxton. No problems getting north of uh, this 15 18% ownership or whatever it is. And I it, even in my first build without making a lot of corrections, I got north of this, so that number is probably going to go up. Um, fine playing this. I, I think he's just underpriced. Jordan Lyles on the other side, absolutely not. Now, the price tag will put him in play in some instances, but I think he's, like, fully cooked, just like Wainwright. There's no swing and miss. The only difference between him and Wainwright right now is that Jordan Lyles is still <laughs> actually throwing strikes. Um, and, you know, Waino's, like, still walking some guy. He's got like an 8-9% walk rate or something like that. That's starting to elevate for him. That's really the only difference from a contact perspective and a power perspective allowed. They're basically identical. So go after Jordan Lyles as much as you can. Boston is a very viable stack here today. And as a matter of fact, they are number two in top, top stack probability for us based on our sheets value aggregate metric. Um, right behind Toronto. But, you know, that said, they are significantly behind Toronto. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so the price tag has to put him in play, but no thank you. I'm Xing it. I do not like this batted ball matchup. I do not like the pure swing and miss matchup for him. Uh, I don't. I think there's very little upside. Could he pop for 15, 17 points? Yeah, maybe. But like, I'm not going to chase that against Boston here. 21% strikeout rate, 180 ISO, 33% hard. And Jordan Lyles gives up fly balls, right, to both sides of the plate. And Boston is a ground ball leaning team with a lot of their hitters, notably Alex Verdugo. Even a Rafi Devers a little bit, he's neutral for the most part. But Mastaki Yoshida definitely will hit a lot of ground balls. So he's a pretty good play here tonight, 4,700. A lot of hard contact here, mostly against the left side for Jordan Lyles. But he still gives up power to righties, too. So I have no problem playing anybody top to bottom. Justin Turner at 4800 Not my favorite price or first base play today, necessarily. Um, but he's certainly fine. He can still lift the baseball, make a lot of hard contact. Adam Duvall, also not my favorite $4,900 outfielder. But perfectly fine. Still 4400 for Trevor Story. I do like that. And Reese McGuire is a fine punt at 2400 behind the plate. No problems playing really anybody top to bottom. Uh, favorites here are, well, it's obviously Rafi Devers, 5,600. I think the price tag is, is too cheap. He should be probably north of 6,000 in this matchup. Um, and same thing with Alex Verdugo. He should be more expensive than 4,500. Really like Yoshida, though, as well. So give me all of Boston as a uh, contrarian. If I don't have 100% Toronto, um, even if I do, I'm probably going to have a good bit of Boston with them as well. Okay, let's move on to, I believe, uh, not... Toronto is not the next game. So uh, Pittsburgh and St. Louis, we'll go over this pretty quickly. I want to play some Mitch Keller, 8,000. I think he's too cheap for this matchup. Now, we got to keep an eye out. Uh, Lars may be activated for the Cardinals tonight, and that gives them the option to go with four lefties in the lineup. Uh, that is reasonable um, to come off a little bit of Mitch Keller if that's the case. Because he has some pretty severe problems with left-handers still, right? No change-up and pretty break-even well, in best-case scenario with the slider and bad value on the curveball here. Um, 337 Woba, 207 ISO. He does have a lot of swing and miss there, so he still can get out of uh, any you know problems that he may get into Excuse me, with the left-handers, but 34% hard contact. He gives up power, and that's attackable with a couple of left-handers here if you choose to do so. But he's so elite against the right side that I don't want to stack any of the Cardinals. It's mostly just one-offs here and you're homer hunting, but I don't want to go out of my way to do that. Uh, from a pricing perspective, Lars is still 4,500, so I don't really want to go after that. Nolan Gorman, he's you know a nice fly ball hitter, 4,200. Don't really want to go after that necessarily, but it's a fine price. Uh, Tommy Edmond, if Lars is back, 
Um, he'll be down at the bottom of the lineup, so there's no chance I play him. And he's far better from the right side than the left side anyway. So, you know, then you've got, like, Alec Burleson in there as well. Who could lift it. He's cheap. Sure, go ahead. But um, that's pretty much it. I want to play Mitch Keller. I think 8000 is just way too cheap. He's had two excellent outings back-to-back. The price tag has actually decreased. He was 86 and 88, and now he's 8000 So, um, now, the Cardinals are not necessarily the Twins or the Cubs, which is who he got in his last several outings. But uh, I think it's reasonable to um, you know, play a good bit of Mitch Keller here at 6% ownership. And in my first build, I came in slightly north of that, but I'm going to massage that a little bit to the upside. I, I like this spot for him, and I would not be surprised if he pops really hard again. To go to Hudson, I'm not playing him at 5,800. Uh, he is in play at the price tag. He is not in play fundamentally for me against Pittsburgh. I like Pittsburgh stacks here a little bit, as a matter of fact. Maybe not full stacks, probably short stacks, because the batted ball profile is still a little difficult to go after with Dakota Hudson, despite a high contact figure at 80%. He still induces a lot of ground balls, buck 90 ground balls per fly ball uh, in aggregate. 35, 36% hard contact is an attackable figure. That's nice. And he does give up a 200 ISO nearly to the right side. Attackable for sure as well. 265 batting average, attackable, and a 350 X Woba, right? attackable as well so these numbers you can go after a little bit of dakota hudson and i certainly like doing that he has some walk issues has some strike one issues so from a a depth perspective uh, i wouldn't be shocked if he lasts six innings here if pittsburgh's just bad tonight uh, because he induces so many ground balls but you're still worried about upside um I think he'd probably be capped at maybe like 20, 21 points, something like that. And I think it's pretty unlikely that he gets a hell of a lot of run support. So, you know, just give me Pittsburgh and and some Mitch Keller here. Uh, they're about a you know, buck 15. You got to lay on them in, in betting markets. I think this is a fine play um, and a sneaky spot for a little bit of Pittsburgh. Favorites are going to have to be Brian Reynolds, Andy Rodriguez, Jack Sawinski, as they are the, the heavy fly ball hitters. Uh, Brian Reynolds, at least from the left side, you know, roughly neutral. Don't really want to deal with Josh Palacios. He's hitting a lot of ground balls. Uh, G1 Bay, same thing with him, but they are cheap and hitting from the left side. If you want to get to some righties, though, go ahead. Throw in Kutch. Throw in a Cabrian Hayes, who's about a neutral ground ball to fly ball here. At 4,400 third base, likely in the middle of the lineup, and it'll give you m- better correlation um, with uh, Andy Rodriguez and Jack Sawinski. Throw in a Cabrian Hayes there in the five hole. Uh, I think that is fine. So like a two, three, five, six, seven, something from the Pirates, I think is uh, absolutely viable if you get two uh, full Pittsburgh stacks or maybe throw in as you want Bay or whatever because he's 3,300 and dual eligible leading off. No problems there, but I prefer Pittsburgh and some correlated Mitch Keller teams. Okay, let's, uh, let's get through Toronto and Colorado here. There's zero pitching whatsoever for me. Now, for me, uh, 6,300 Yunjin Ryu is actually in play here. Um, now, historically, he has struggled at Coors Field. You don't want to do this. He's got a lot of history here, being with the Dodgers for so long and, you know, whatever. Um, I don't want to do this because he throws mostly a curveball. I don't trust this pitch at, at altitude, even though Charlie Morton, um, you know, he was fine. His curveball is is great, and Yunjin Ryu's curveball is also pretty damn good. Um, so can he survive? He's still throwing some of this pitch? Yeah, of course. Um, difference between him and Charlie Morton is that, well, he's got four other pitches that he's very well distributed with. Charlie is a little bit more exaggerated in some of his, his other stuff. Um, and he's going to be able to stay down in the strike zone still, Ryu, with the sinker cutter change. Charlie Morton, you know, maybe not so much. Um, so I think it's a little bit better. It was a little bit better matchup for Charlie Morton. Uh also, Charlie's got, you know, whatever, 25% Ks in the tank, uh, really to both sides of the plate. Yunjin Ryu, at least in the short sample here this season, only 20, 21%. So that's a bit of a concern and why I don't really want to play him um, with all that much ownership. However, I did run some without making any corrections. And, you know, I got like 5% Ryu team. So that's not nothing. And 6,300 is has to put him in play because the Rockies against left-handers at Coors Field or not are absolutely atrocious. 65 WRC plus, they don't walk. They strike out a crap load at 27%. Don't hit for average. They don't hit for power. It's just a little bit of hard contact and some line drives, but they're weak ground balls, mostly from like uh, Harold Castro types, um, you know, and, and, 
you know, really weak contact from Elias Diaz types and, and things like this uh, for most of the season. Now, I love Zitovar. I love Brendan Rodgers at their respective price tags. I even like a little bit of uh, Elias Diaz. But for the most part, um, you know, that, that has to put Yunjin Ryu in play because he's still a better arm than 6,300, even though the short sample uh, does not totally reflect that. Uh, even at Coors Field, now it's very warm tonight at, at Coors, you know, 90 plus degrees, super dangerous with a curveball and a pretty poor change, at least in the early going here. So I'm just going to exit, I think, because um, you're not sacrificing a hell of a lot of, you know, leverage or negative leverage, if you will, to the field if you just X out 1% ownership of a guy. You know, you're not you're not going to get burned all that often. Um and I don't think it's a all that high a, a leverage spot if you only get 5% of your teams with Yunjin Ryu, like how much progress you're really making. All it takes is one, but even still, uh, I think it's probably a bit aggressive for my risk profile. So I'm just going to stay off of it. And that means I want to play some Rockies. Um, they're, of course, you know, a, a top three stack today, getting a lefty at Coors Field, 90 degree weather, you know, guy throws a curveball, whatever. Um, you know, but they're still a bad offense against left-handed pitching. So... I'm a little less thrilled than perhaps the projection models um, are with Colorado tonight. That said, I do love Zeke Dovar, Brandon Rogers, a little bit of Elias Diaz. Like Hunter Goodman still, he's 3,200. He's at first base solely, so that's not excellent now. Michael Tolia coming around a little bit, still has fine numbers from both sides of the plate, despite the uh, strikeout stuff for him. Eloris Montero, also a lot of pop. Got to choose between him and Goodman, however. Uh, Brenton Doyle really, really struggling, though. He's striking out against everybody, so pretty difficult to get excited about him, but he's fine in full five stacks or wraparound stacks if you end up getting to Colorado. Uh, so you can always play Colorado in, in low strike or high contact and low strikeout matchups for them, but uh, it's a really difficult spot because they're not very good, right? They're, what, uh, 35 games under 500? It's kind of egregious uh, playing all your games at Coors Field. Uh, Toronto on the other side, we're playing every single one of them. Uh, we can get through it really quickly. I, I like all of them. Uh, they, every one of them is too cheap. Now, you can make decisions, right, for ownership and for price tag considerations. Like Whit Merrifield, 4,900. You could pivot off of that if you want. Um, you could pivot off of David Schneider at 4,800. Price tag, uh, you know, respective, I guess I should say. I, I like George Springer the best, probably, at 5,100. Vladdy at 55. His price is a little elevated for where he's been but he's still probably 400 underpriced for where he should be in this matchup like each one of these guys should be 5500 or more they should be getting the atlanta treatment price tag wise uh at coors field here tonight against chris flexen so literally every single one of them love the left handers from a batter ball perspective as well because flexen still induces uh, a lot of ground balls, so give me Brandon Belt, give me Dalton Varsho, fly ball hitters, right, even Cab Biggio if they throw him in there or whatever. Uh, Kiermaier is fine too, 3,400 contact piece, no problems. Every single one of them, I want to get to as much Toronto as I can, and I very well may just build 100% of my teams with Toronto. This is, as I mentioned, probably the best spot of the entire season from a fundamental perspective. Prices are aligning with that. You just have to balance ownership, and you're going to have to get contrarian when you get so much Toronto tonight. Okay, let's move on. San Francisco, San Diego. Tristan Beck, 5,100. Probably only going to go about three, four innings here tonight. Um, he's done this, uh, what, in every outing, he's been the, like kind of a long reliever out of the bullpen. They've given him one start or whatever. We've got him starting because that's who MLB has. Um, they might open him, but they might choose to run, you know, a, a pig. A, piggyback bullpen game or something like that have him go three innings bring in somebody else you know who, who knows what the hell Kapler's going to do down here um so can't really play him at 5100 i did get a, a good bit of him um because he still has a 10 point projection he's still going to go three four innings but i think he's too expensive when i don't have a actual five inning upside he hasn't shown five innings literally all season so um i can't do it i think the strikeout numbers against right handers are fine and this is why I don't want to stack the Padres in a bullpen game, uh, because this offense just sucks. They're 100 WRC+, plus, and they don't hit for any average. They hit for very little power. They walk a lot uh, and don't strike out a lot, but the, the contact profile just isn't very good. And Tristan Beck has a lot of you know, pretty good numbers against right-handers, at least. Sub-230 batting average, 250 Woba, 075 ISO, and a 24% strikeout rate. 28% hard contact um, with a 130 ground ball to fly ball. Like, that's pretty damn good. 
and I don't want to be playing any of the Padres over here. I think they're too expensive at their normal price tags. I don't think they're very good. I don't think they warrant these price tags necessarily. So um, not interested in playing really any of them. That's why I would play Tristan Beck if he were stretched out, but he's not. So can't really do anything here. Um, Michael Walker on the other side. I, 8,300, I want to play him too. Now, it's going to be hard for me to get a, a, a ton of ownership, but he's one of my favorites here in this price range. I think this matchup is fantastic for him, getting a, a very heavy platoon offense um, in the Giants over here. They're going to have probably six lefties in the lineup, I would guess, tonight. Now, we'll see what they want to do. They've got some guys in the DL. Did They just, just bring back uh, Mike Yastrzemski. But they also brought back uh, Mitch Kaniger as well. They've got Yaz, Bailey, uh, Jock, Lamont Wade, maybe a Wade Meckler. Who knows what they want to do um, you know, with some of these other guys. But there's still going to be some swing and miss there for Waka. And he's excellent against the left side, man. 23% with a really good change of 23% strikeouts. That is really good change up. That's where all the value is coming from. Two-seamer is equitable because he's staying off of it to left-handers and throwing it only to righties, and that's reflecting in the 201 batting average allowed. 080, 090 ground ball to fly ball to the righties. Um, that's a little bit of a concern with some 33% hard contact, but that's how you want to attack Michael Walker. It's with right-handers, not lefties. So do I really want to be playing J.D. Davis, though? He strikes out a 30% clip and hits two ground balls per fly ball, so no thanks. Do I want to play Mitch Hanniger? Yeah, I love Mitch Hanniger, but he hasn't had all that much um, exposure at the big league level because he's been hurt so damn much over the last three, four seasons nearly. So not my favorite at 4,000, to be quite honest. Tyro is okay, but I don't really want to be playing a 4,400 second base. I'd probably rather play like Nolan Gorman, 42, for example. So um, don't really want to be playing a lot of the Giants here, and I think that has to put Waka in play. Uh, I also came in roughly with the field here, so when I make my full changes, that number's probably just going to go up. But as you could probably tell, I like a lot of pitchers here today, and I like, well, two offenses that we've talked about. Maybe another that we'll get to in, in the next couple of games. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how I want to approach it. No Padres, some Waka. Not a lot of Waka because I'm worried that the Padres are going to be able to provide him any run support. Um, but I think the price tag's too cheap in this particular matchup. I think there's upside here that we can squeeze out of this. Certainly a 10% ownership. No problems there. Okay, uh, Baltimore and Arizona. Now, if you're going to get outside of Coors for a game stack, this is the one. Because Cole Irvin and Zach Davies pitched to way too much contact. 82% for Irvin, 80% flat for Zach Davies. Now, both of the price tags for these guys have to put them in play in general. However, the fundamentals are going to take them right back out. Cole Irvin... You want him more against lefty heavy teams, and the and the D backs are going to platoon way too heavily here tonight. They're going to be able, they've got like ground ball and neutral type of ground ball to fly ball type um, of hitters against Cole Irvin. That's not how you really want to, um, you know, be considering Cole Irvin, I should say. So give me some of the D backs here. They're at playable price tags for sure. Cattel Marte, 5,000 flat. Buddy Kennedy's going to make everything work for you. He's 2,200 third base. They might have him in the two hole. They've been doing that a little bit recently. That's a fine play. One of the better value plays of the day, as a matter of fact. Tommy Pham's been fantastic against lefties, as has Christian Walker. Uh, Lourdes Gurriel still hit some ground balls. Not a ton of power there now that he's cooled off from his midseason sort of homer barrage. Uh, but Evan Longoria hits a hell of a lot of fly balls, a lot of power still against lefties. Um, you can play Corbin Carroll. You can always play Corbin Carroll. He's 58 in the seven hole, though, likely, so that's kind of stiff. But Cole Irvin's unlikely to be super long for this game as it is. Um, so give me the D-backs. I like, I like them a pretty good bit, including Gabby Moreno. He might be in the nine hole, however, which really sucks uh, because he's been seeing the baseball really, really well recently. Uh, and I want to play that at 2,600, but that might take me off. I hate playing catchers in the nine hole at uh, on home teams. So... That said, I, I still love the D-backs. I love going after low upside lefties or righties um, You know, with Arizona. Even though their numbers in aggregate against left-handers are just 92 WRC+, plus, they still don't strike out. This is a high upside spot for them. Um, but those numbers are what the numbers are. And Cole Irvin is probably a better arm than 5,200. Maybe not much better because... You know, he still has the problems here with the 186 ISO allowed, fly balls, hard contact to the right side with some batting average. Um, you know, but 
to strike one, the walk rate kind of keeps him in play. He's got good chase still at 31%. 10.5% barrel rate, though, is a, a pretty big concern. So we want to be careful with that. And I want to play the D-backs. Um, Baltimore is getting Zach Davies on the other side. 5,700 for him. Same sort of deal, but... I'd much rather just play Cole Urban if I'm going to choose than play Zach Davies against Baltimore. Um, you know, Baltimore is a better run creation offense against right-handers. You know, split adjusted here than the D-backs against lefties. Neutral ground ball to fly ball, 33%, about average hard contact, 170 ISO nearly. That's, you know, two ticks is two ticks here in, in isolated power. 22% strikeout rate, still sticky, 250 batting average. Etc. Etc. With a 320 Woba, they're going to walk a little bit more, of course, due to Rutch at the, uh, the top of the lineup. So I think it's very viable to get to Baltimore. If I have to choose between the two, give me Arizona because they're cheaper. Um, but give me Baltimore from a pure fundamental per- perspective, price agnostic. I like Rutch here a little bit, not so much at 54 on a 14 game slate catcher piece leading off, but uh, you know he's Rutch. It's fine. Gunner absolutely at 55. He still makes a lot of hard contact. Right, 47% hard contact, I believe, against righties uh, this season, and he'll hit the baseball in the air. He's got a little bit of a ground ball lean, but uh, Davies will give that up on a line to him tonight, so that's perfectly fine at dual eligible third and shortstop, 5,500 in the two hole. Anthony Santander, Ryan O'Hearn, Cedric Mullins are the the big fly ball hitters, so that's who I would focus on in stacks. Ryan Mountcastle, though, you could play him as well. Not my favorite, 4,800 first base play necessarily, but Zach Davies, as we can see here, 200 ISO to the right handers. Also with 38% hard contact. So you need guys that can lift it here tonight. Austin Hayes' numbers are still respectable. He still hits nearly 300 against right-handers, too. Power, not so much. 4,400, yeah, maybe not so much, but fine in stacks. I do like Baltimore. I do like Arizona a good bit. I'm going to probably just come off of all the pitching. I don't want to deal with it. Maybe leave him in the pool because you're not going to get a hell of a lot anyway, just for some you know, differentiation or whatever. Uh, but it's mostly offense here for me. I like this game for tournaments. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, they're right up there, uh, right behind Boston, Colorado, as, you know, two of the top six stacks today. So um, really intriguing tournament game here. All right, Angels and Oakland. Patty Sandoval, I want to play him too. Now, uh, 7,200, I, I like this. I'm probably going to come in roughly, um, you know, at similar ownership here to the field, maybe even get a little bit more depending on how things shake out. Now, I do want to see an Oakland lineup here tonight, um, and that'll probably dictate how aggressive I get with Patty. It's not because of a price tag. It's not because of the ground balls. I love all this. It's mostly because of strikeout stuff. If they lead off Asiri Ruiz here, he's much better against lefties than he is against righties. And... This is a left-hander. It's going to make it a little bit difficult for Patty because he'll still pitch to some contact. Give right-handers a little bit of batting average, right? 250 with, uh, you know, not so much power, but he does also have an 11% walk rate. So that's dangerous with Asturi Ruiz. He's been really struggling recently, um, and they moved him down all the way to the bottom of the lineup, even against lefties when they had him leading off the whole year. But... He still has plenty of speed, plenty of upside, and plenty of um, you know pest value, if you will, to get after Patty and make it a little difficult on him if he leads off. So it, if he's up at the top, then I'll probably come in closer to the field with Patty. If he's down at the bottom, I actually do want to get more Patty because the other guys, batted ball-wise, they hit too many ground balls, and their swing and miss is just kind of out of control. Jonah Bride doesn't swing and miss, but he hits... Two to one ground balls per fly ball, so no thanks from the right side there. Jordan Diaz hits ground balls. Ledmus Diaz hits ground balls. Really, the best batted ball profile here is Brent Rooker, 3600. He's the one piece from the right side that I want to go after uh, Patty with and go out of my way to get. He is an 080, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, an 080 ground ball to fly ball guy. His problem is strikeouts, of course, but Patty not going to do that necessarily at a high, super high clip, just 20% versus Brent Rooker's 30% against righties. So that's a 213 ISO and still hits 270 against the right side with 42% hard contact. He's the one if I get after anybody. And Asteria Ruiz, from a contact perspective, also doesn't strike out 19% K rate with, uh, you know, he'll hit ground balls, of course. So the batted ball profile is not there for him. Um, but from a pure contact perspective and a batted ball, or a, a swing and miss perspective, I should say, um, it is there. There is a little bit of upside for Ruiz. I don't want to play him 
um, necessarily. You could play him with like a short stack, Brent Rooker, Steery Ruiz, and a, I don't know, a cheap Zach Geloff, or an expensive Zach Geloff, and a cheap Jonah Bride, I should say. Um, if you want to get there, Carlos Perez, I mean, okay, whatever. You could make something happen here if you get out of control with your patty exposure. Um, but I want to play him instead. I think his price tag is better than everybody over here on Oakland, so Brent Rooker is the only one I want to play. JP Sears, 6,500. I'm just going to come come in off of this, I think, um, and probably just X him. I don't like the power, man. He just gives up way too much. There's batting average to left-handers, not so much batting average to right-handers, but there's power there really to both sides, right? 221 X ISO and not a hell of a lot of swing and miss. He does have some to the righties at 24%. But he's a heavy, heavy, heavy fly ball pitcher with some hard contact there against righties that gives up homers, man, and a lot of barrels. 25, or excuse me, 12.5% uh, barrel rate. That's a problem. The only reason I think J.P. Sears could see a little bit of value here tonight, number one is the Angels. They're kind of bad now. Um, number two, he's he induces so many fly balls and, you know, a respectable batting average against the right side. This game's in Oakland, right? And he doesn't give up all that much hard contact in the air, even though it is elevated for sure at 32%. It's still 60, 65 degrees in Oakland tonight, and this is why he's seen 14% ownership. He can be difficult to stack against sometimes, but he'll give up pop, man. And it's not like he'll give up homers. That's going to be drastically reduced in Oakland. Um, but he's efficient. He doesn't walk guys and he has really good strike one with pretty damn good chase. He's still at a respectable arm, even though he has problems getting on the barrel here. Um, he does still have some strikeouts, right? And the angels here, they will strike out against left-handed pitching, still a 24% aggregate strikeout rate this year. Um, they're probably going to call up some guys too. Who knows what the hell they're going to do. But I think a Brandon Drury, Randall Grishik, Logan O'Hoppy in the middle of the lineup. I think that's an intriguing little right-handed three-man stack. I don't want to play Luis Renjifo or Shanuel at the top, of course. Shohei Otani, of course, you can, you can always play. That That's not really a problem. Uh, Eddie Escobar, great numbers against left-handers this year from the right side of the plate. Dual eligible, and he's 2,700. That's fantastic. Probably be Hunter Renfro and not Mickey Moniak in the outfield, so that's fine also. Um, Angels are calling up a the hit tool um, shortstop piece for him, Kyron Paris, and... That would be a very cheap way to make Otani happen, for example, if you get there at shortstop. Uh, so you could find an Angel stack here, but this is in Oakland in a 14-game slate. You really want to go out of your way to do this? Uh, it's going to be hard for them you know, to, to really hit the baseball out. And maybe short stacks would probably be my favorite. Brandon Drury, uh, Randall Grichik from a contact perspective, not so much from a power perspective, and Logan O'Hoppy, certainly the favorites there. But I like Patty, maybe, maybe a Patty and a short three-man Angels correlated team, something like that. I think that's perfectly viable. Okay, um, last game of the night here. We're running kind of long. Max Freed, 9,000. No thanks. Just can't do it against the Dodgers. Uh, I have upside concerns always with Max Freed um, from a pure swing and miss perspective because he induces so many ground balls. And he's just about you know, slightly above average in the swing and miss. This uh, The two-seamer that he doesn't induce a lot of swing strikes with is still kind of an issue. Um and this is the Dodgers here. I don't want to screw around. So I'm just going to leave him off. I'm going to play just other guys. I, I can't get to a 9,000 when I want to play literally seven other dudes in this range. So 57% um, strike one is a problem against the Dodgers. He's not going to walk guys, right? He still has some swing and miss, still stays off the barrel, still induces ground balls with no hard contact. That's all very much attractive. You want to play him on the late slate? Go ahead. But I'm just going to stay off of this in the uh, on the main slate. I think other... Pitchers have far higher upside with more regularity than Max Fried against the Dodgers tonight. So that's how I'm going to approach it. Not That's not to say that I want to go after him because I really respect him. Um, you know, you always play Mookie, do whatever, but he's 6,800. You want to do that? 56 for Will Smith. Eh, like, no thanks. So that's how I want to approach Max Fried and the Dodgers tonight. Uh, 7,800 for Julio Urias. Um, now, he struggled quite a bit with contact this year as well. And power, 181 XI. So he's running way, way cold. But he gets Dodgers, so this is a horrible matchup for him, too. Or, excuse me, he gets the Braves. Um, so I'm not dealing with this either. He's super efficient early in the count, 5% walk Excuse me, 5% walk rate with an 8% barrel rate. Everything's great there, but he's a fly ball pitcher that's given up some power and some hard contact this season, so I'm not dealing with that against the Braves. So if you want to play them, sure, go ahead. But they're all at their normal price tags in a, what I consider a down matchup generally. Um 
so like, are we really all that excited about doing this? You can play Marcelo Suna. He's been incredible over the last you know month and a half. That's fine. Um, Ozzy Albies from the right side, yeah, yeah, he's he's better from batting average perspective. He has more power from the left side, but like you know whatever. Acuna, of course, always you could no problem playing him. Maybe in Orlando Arcia, 43. He's got good numbers uh, against lefties this year. Kevin Pillar, okay at 3,002 uh, against another one of his former teams. Um, so I got I'd pref- much prefer the Braves here if I get to this game. I probably won't, but having token Braves exposure against every single pitcher in baseball is is warranted, and especially when they're completely off the board and totally unowned. So um, don't be surprised if the Braves pop for a late height, late night hammer here. A little three man. Uh, I could very much be convinced that uh, that's a viable construction if you could make that happen. And there's enough cheap arms today that you can. So uh, no problems doing that, uh, but very little Max Freed and probably no Julio Urias here for me tonight. Okay, we're done, even though we've gone quite long here today. A lot of games, a lot of pitchers to talk about. Let's review real quick. Miami and Washington. I like Miami here um, against Jake Irvin. Not so much the right-handers outside of Georgie Soler, but you have to keep an eye on him with the hip. Uh, but I do like Miami stacks if we could make that happen. Tampa and Cle- no Washington. I'm not dealing with this against Yuri. I respect him, but no Yuri for me. Um, at 8,800, I think he's overpriced, and I don't, I've got depth concerns. So that's, that's where we are there. Tampa and Cleveland. Uh, I do like Tampa here a little bit, getting some Cal Quantrill back. I hate targeting pitchers after they come off the DL because they're usually much better. He is a better arm than whatever 5,300 uh, a 5,300 price tag suggests. Um, but this is still Tampa and they still make a lot of contact. I want fly ball hitters. That's Brandon Lau and Josh Lowe. Um, you know, notably from the left side, but you can get to some right handers too. He'll give up a little bit of pop as well and a lot of contact to right-handers, uh, really to both sides. Uh, so no Cal and no Glasnow for me either. I don't want to go after Cleveland, and he's way too expensive. I'm just going to come in way under. I might even just exit, uh, even though I hate doing that with Glasnow. Uh, I like the ownership, yeah, but I hate the matchup, and I'd rather just play uh, plenty of other guys far, far cheaper. Seattle and the Mets, um, I'm going to have some Logan Gilbert. I'll probably have a little bit of Kodai Senga, but I might just X him too. I hate the damn walk rate, man. And Seattle is really streaking. They're, they've been playing excellent baseball over the last month. Um, leading the division now. Do I want to play any of C- Seattle? Uh, no, not really. Uh, maybe a left-hander, I, I, mean, I guess, but Cal Raleigh's probably going to strike out a lot. Um, and I don't want to play Julio at 64 or Teoscar at 46 now. Uh, J.P. Crawford, maybe, because he didn't strike out a lot, but, like, yeah. Um, so mostly pitching here. I don't want to play the Mets against Logan Gilbert because I really respect Logan Gilbert. So um, I just... Just a write-off for from an offensive perspective for me, and give me some Gilbert. Minnesota and Texas, uh, no Minnesota here tonight outside of Eddie Julian. Joe Ryan for me, yeah, I think he's in play against Texas, even though I hate going after the Rangers. Max Scherzer, I'm probably just going to come off of him too just because he's too expensive. I got, what, 10% ownership on him? Um, I'm fine with that because this is the, a far, far better matchup than Glasnow against Cleveland, of course. Um so that's how I'll have my exposure, but I don't really want to play any Texas tonight outside of maybe a Mitch Garver, uh, maybe a short stack against Joe Ryan because it's the second time they're seeing him in as many days. Um, and you could play some Minnesota for the same reason against Scherzer, who has a homer problem. That's okay. You know, there are arguments to be made here, uh, but I'm... I will just side with Scherzer, stay off of all the Minnesota, and give me Corey Seager. Yeah, of course. So that's how I want to play that game. Yankees, Houston. Um, no Yankees outside of Judge and Jason Dominguez here tonight against Verlander. I'm going to have some Verlander for sure at 9,800, I believe. Um, he's probably my favorite fundamental play in this range. I, I mean, I think, but like, there's a ton of guys that I want to play. Um, and I think they're all pretty damn close fundamentally. So no problems getting to Verlander. It's probably just the price tag. It's going to keep my ownership down, even though he was, he was one of my most exposed here in the early going. Uh, Houston, yeah, I like stacks here against Rodone. There's zero chance I play any of him. Um, Battle ball profile-wise, Martin Maldonado. Can you really play him tonight? Yikes. Um, sure, let's do it. And you, you throw in a lefty like a Kyle Tucker or Jordan Alvarez, okay? But Josie Abreu, probably my favorite price-adjusted play from Houston. Probably the only time I'm going to say that this year. Philly and Milwaukee. Uh, Zach Wheeler, I probably want to try and play a little bit here. Uh, Freddie Peralta, I probably want to try and play a little bit here, fundamentally. But from a price tag perspective, I just want to play cheaper guys. I think they have higher upside um, at their respective price tags. But in these respective matchups, eh, maybe not. So that's probably going to give me a little bit of exposure to both of these guys. I don't want any offense. Philly because they're stupidly expensive against Freddie and Milwaukee because they stink. 
so that's how I'm going to approach that. Detroit, I want to play some five stacks of Detroit with some correlated Eddie Rodriguez against the White Sox. And I'm going to have some Tukey Tucson as well, even despite the stupidly frustrating walk rate. 6,000 uh, from a construction standpoint today just makes it too difficult to avoid, I believe. But stacks for the White Sox are in play as well from a price perspective. But give me Detroit, give me Eddie. I think they're a very viable stack. Boston, Kansas City, give me pretty much all of Boston, top to bottom. I love James Paxton, and I like Boston quite a bit as well. Uh, I do not like Jordan Lyles at all, even though a 5,500 price tag, I believe, will keep him in play, not in this particular matchup. Um, I think he's probably due to get beat up again, and, well, there's nothing new with Jordan Lyles. Um no Kansas City for me. I'm just staying off of it. Uh, just give me some James Paxton. If I have, you know, 30% of Paxton or whatever, yeah, I'll, I have some hedge pieces or, or whatever, but that's pretty much it. Pittsburgh, St. Louis. I want to play some five-man Pittsburgh. Uh, well, maybe just some three-man Pit Pittsburgh with Mitch Keller, but a five-man could be found, I suppose, against Dakota Hudson because he pitches to a lot of contact. Um, problems with lefties, but he gives up power to right-handers too. You want some fly ballers, Sawinski, Indy, Rodriguez. Notably, but uh, you could play a Brian Hayes too, if you, you know if you want. That's a, a pretty good play, uh, or a Kutch, or you know whoever kind of there in the middle of the lineup. Uh, G1 Bay is, is fine if you want to do that. Uh, no Dakota Hudson for me. I'm gonna stay off of that. Maybe a Nolan Gorman on the other side. I will only lefties against Mitch Keller if I get a lot of him. But I'm gonna have a lot of Mitch Keller. Uh, Toronto and Colorado, every single one of Toronto's pieces, even maybe a couple of Yonji Rio teams. Even though, I mean, I don't know. I'll probably just exit because it's. Uh, it's pretty concerning, and you don't give up all that much equity. Uh, but he's in play, 6,300, because the Rockies are horrible, horrible, horrible against left-handed pitching. No Chris Flexen, of course, whatsoever. Uh, give every single one of Toronto's right-handers mostly, but he gives it up to the lefties too. I don't really care. Some short Colorado pieces for me. I think that's how I'd like to get a little bit different with this game uh, and play Tovar, Brendan Rodgers, and, uh, you know, maybe 100 Goodman, something like that. San Francisco, San Diego, no San Francisco for me here. Uh, just give me some Waka at 8,300. I like this this spot for him. I think there's a good bit of upside at the price tag. No San Diego because they're going to get a bullpen game, and they're terrible. Uh, Baltimore and Arizona, no Cole Irvin and no Zach Davies. If i got to choose between the two, if I'm all the way down here, it is Cole Irvin, but, like, gulp. Um, give me offense. I think this is a very intriguing tournament game. Nobody's going to be played in this game because everybody's going to be on Toronto and Boston. So uh, this is super viable if you want to get to a game stack. Um, it might be difficult price-wise to make that happen because there's not many cheap pitchers that you could um, you know, find a, a, an equitable construction for uh, in that scenario. Um, so you might have to choose Arizona or Baltimore. If I got to choose, it's probably Arizona because they're cheaper. But I, from a fundamental perspective, I like Baltimore a little bit better. So uh, really cool game there. Angels and Oakland. Patty Sandoval, yeah, I'm going to have a good bit of him at 72. Uh, probably no J.P. Sears for me tonight, even though 65 has to put him in play. Um, I think the Angels are a little sticky here against left-handed pitching still, despite the fact that they strike out. Uh, they can be uh, kind of pesky sometimes with some of these pickups. Um, uh, and they still, of course, have Shoya Otani. It's, you know, it, he's no slouch. J.P. Sears still gives up power to everybody. So, Going to stay off of that. Oakland pieces. Brent Rooker is by far the favorite. 3,600, I believe. Um, maybe in Asturia Ruiz at the top if he leads off. Zach Geloff, eh, okay. 53, not super stoked about it because I really respect Patty and the ground ball rate. It's just, he'll pitch just some contact sometimes. Um, and that's what could keep him from popping for a full 25 or 30. But I'm going to have a good bit of him, I think. And mostly a write-off here for me. I will, I'll have some Atlanta. I think I'm going to try and go out of my way to uh, go after Urias, but I really hate doing that. I really respect him. Uh, he's a far better arm than 7,800. So if you land on a couple of 7,800 pieces, um, like with Paxton, <laughs> you know, you can't play him instead or something. I'd, be, I'd much rather pivot it to Patty Sandoval. But, um, you know, it's, it's not egregious. You could certainly find a construction with Urias that could be viable uh, but it's a super, super dangerous spot. He's a better arm than 7,800, just plain and simple. Uh, same thing with Max Freed. He's a better arm than 9,000, but this is a horrible matchup for him, so I'm just going to stay off, and I'm going to play all these other dudes. Uh, so that's how I want to play it. No Dodgers for me, and a lot of Toronto, as much Toronto as I can get. Um, and that's uh, I very well may have 100% tonight. Who knows? Projections and ownership, keep an eye out for those. And balance ownership. Get very different, because you're going to have to, because ownership is... is um, in that with 
in your Toronto stacks, easy for me to say, is the absolute key to winning this evening. Um, not that it's a bad spot, but it's uh, you got to balance it there. So good luck to everybody here on Friday's 14 Gamer.